Section 4 State and Federal Securities Laws. Interestingly, if you have your CFP designation, most states will not require you to take the Series 65 or Series 66 test. So if that's any of you listening to me right now, watching this video, you don't have to do it in most states. Granted, of course, always check with your state. But for the purposes of this test, a person with a CFP designation is exempt from the examination requirements. You would still need to file for registration, of course, and pay your fees. So you would still have to do a U4 form. You would have to hold your CFP designation in good standing, pay your fees, and all investment advisor representatives register at the state level. If you are named as a trustee, the first thing you should do under the Prudent Investor Act is review the trust portfolio and make sure that it is in line with the scope and purposes of the trust and make any adjustments as needed to ensure compliance with the trust document and provisions of the Uniform Prudent Investor Act. Remember, the broker-dealer is the firm. The investment advisor is also the firm level. So forget what we say out there in the real world. IAR, that's you, investment advisor representative. So you take your test, file your U4 form, but you work for the investment advisor. That is the firm. They're the ones who file form ADV. A broker-dealer can refer clients to an investment advisor without needing to be an investment advisor itself. The broker-dealer would have to register as an investment advisor, however, to share a referral fee. You can never share a fee with anyone unless they are properly registered. So if your friend who happens to be a CPA made a referral to you, you have your IAR designation, you cannot share a fee with your friend unless they also are an IAR with the same firm or with one that's indirect or indirect common control. The SEC requires that shareholders of a company whose securities are registered under the Securities Exchange Act receive a proxy statement prior to a shareholder meeting, whether or not it's an annual meeting or a special meeting. The information contained in this proxy statement must be filed with the SEC before soliciting a shareholder vote on the election of directors and the approval of other corporate actions. Solicitations, whether by management or shareholders, must disclose all important facts about the issues on which shareholders are asked to vote. So this idea that as a shareholder you should receive a proxy statement, it really gives you the information you would need as a shareholder to make an informed decision when you are asked to vote. It is possible that the investment advisor can vote their clients shares for them. If the investment advisor does that, this fact would be disclosed in the investment advisor's firm brochure. So form ADV part 2A. There's an area of the firm's brochure that talks about the proxy voting practices of the investment advisor. So casting a ballot on behalf of another person is called casting a proxy vote. Mutual funds also do this. So as a shareholder of a mutual fund, you don't vote as far as the, there's lots of shares of stock in the portfolio. You don't vote on each of those individual shares of stock what is done, but the mutual fund votes for you on your behalf. It is possible, let's say you own shares of Disney stock, it is possible to vote yourself. A lot of people don't, they just let other people cast their votes for them. You're always invited as a shareholder of a publicly traded company to go to their annual meeting. But very oftentimes it just doesn't work with your schedule. It's out of town, you can't go. Items that you're generally asked to vote on, 
members of the board approving a merger or acquisition. As shareholders, you have a say on pay. You vote for to approve or reject the executive compensation package. It's a non-binding say on pay. So just because the shareholders vote down that the executive compensation package does not mean that they have to pay them a different amount, but they might listen to the shareholders. So like I said, you can choose to vote yourself as a shareholder of a publicly traded company, or you can agree to let someone vote your shares for you. You can even tell somebody that they can vote for you online today. Broker-dealers, agents, and investment advisors must file consent to service of process. We talked about that. There's just the, it's the way the law is written. So in the general part of the course, we discussed, for some reason, the way the law is written, broker-dealers and agents and the firm IA file consent to service of process. Another way of saying that is not the IAR. I already mentioned you can never pay someone for a referral unless they are registered as IARs. So when you pay someone a referral fee, they're acting in the capacity of a solicitor. So all solicitors must be registered as IARs. All solicitors must give out two brochures, the firm brochure and a solicitor's brochure. How the solicitor gets paid must be disclosed on the solicitor's brochure. A person who sells market reports would be considered an investment advisor, no matter the frequency of the reports. Let's say that a broker-dealer is new to a state, so they open up a new office in another state. Can they do business in the other state without registration? No. The minute they have an office in another state, broker-dealers and investment advisors must register in every state in which they have an office. If you receive stock when you buy merchandise, for example, you bought a new car, and in exchange for buying the new car, they gave you shares of the automobile manufacturer's stock. How odd would that be? But if they did, this would be considered both an offer and a sale. The stock, of course, would have to be registered. Anytime custody is part of the investment advisory contract, the IA is required to send out to the customers quarterly statements. It is the customer that must know where the money is being held, not the, not the administrator. So be very careful. The test loves this idea. The client must be notified of the location of their money and securities anytime custody is part of the contract. The administrator must know if custody is part of the contract, but the administrator does not need to know where the money and securities are located. When custody is part of the contract, the account balances must be surprise audited on an annual basis by an independent CPA. Any time you place a trade based upon oral discretionary authority, you must receive written discretionary authority within 10 days after the date of the first transaction placed by oral authority. So, for example, the client gives you oral discretion to do whatever you want today, but you don't actually place the trade for the client today. You don't place the trade for the client based upon that oral discretion until Friday. It's within 10 business days of Friday, the date that you first exercise that oral discretion. Not from the date that the client gave it to you, but from when you placed a trade based upon the oral discretion. So basically what it means is that you have 10 business days to do whatever you want. If you haven't received written discretion within those 10 business days, you cannot any longer place any more discretionary trades. You must stop. It doesn't mean you have to sell out of the account which you've already done, you just cannot any longer place any discretionary trades. The administrator will require financials of the firm. So broker dealers and investment advisors must make available to the state securities administrator whichever financials they are asked to provide. 
agents and investment advisor representatives never have to disclose their financials. You may, however, as an investment advisor representative, be required to post a bond. So agents may be required to post a bond. The administrator has the authority to cancel your license if you cannot be located, if you are found to be incompetent, or if you are not acting in a capacity in which you are registered. So you can't just be registered as an investment advisor representative unless you're actually engaged in this industry. Just like the firm can't be registered unless they're actually engaging in this industry. As an investment advisor representative, you can hire a secretary. She could not be engaged in investment advisory work, however. So they use the term secretary on the test. Administrative assistant is much better, I believe, personally today, because of course, could be you know, a female or a male. So when the test uses terms like secretary, I'll just use the same terms that the test will use. The secretary could answer phone calls, she could set appointments, she could engage in purely clerical work. No giving of investment advice is allowed unless a person is registered as an IAR. When you are a registered representative, when you are an investment advisor representative, you are allowed to have a job outside of your job within the securities industry, but you must give your firm prior notification so whenever you are registered, the FINRA rule requires you tell your firm prior to when you engage in this outside activity. So you are allowed to take a part-time job. They're never going to say no to you, but you have to tell them. You're going to have to do an amendment to your U4 form. Being a silent partner is considered a passive activity and would not require prior firm notification. ERISA, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, does some very specific things. It requires plans, so qualified plans, to provide participants with information about the plan, including important information about plan features and funding. The plan must furnish some information regularly and automatically. Some information will be available free of charge and some is not. ERISA sets minimum standards for participation, vesting, benefit accrual, and funding. ERISA defines how long a person may be required to work beca before becoming eligible to participate in a plan, to accumulate benefits, and to have a non-forfeitable right to those benefits. ERISA also establishes detailed funding rules that require plan sponsors to provide adequate funding for the plan. ERISA requires accountability of plan fiduciaries. ERISA generally defines a fiduciary as anyone who exercises discretionary authority or control over a plan's management or assets, including anyone who provides investment advice to the plan. Fiduciaries that do not follow the principles of conduct may be held responsible for restoring losses to the plan. ERISA gives participants the rights to sue for benefits and breaches of fiduciary duty. ERISA also guarantees payment of certain benefits if a defined plan is terminated through a federally chartered corporation, which we have talked about. It's called the PBGC, Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. So remember, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation only covers participants in defined benefit plans. So just a review of what ERISA does. Generally speaking, we say ERISA governs corporate pension and profit sharing plans. A statement of policy is the contract between the money manager, generally an investment advisor, and the client. The client may be a fund or an individual. This statement of policy includes the investment objective and goals of the client and the strategies that the advisor should employ to meet those goals. 
The statement of policy would include asset allocation information, risk tolerance, and any liquidity requirements. Registration for a person. So this would include a broker, a broker dealer, an agent, an investment advisor, and an investment advisor representative. Their registrations expire at the state level every December 31st. An application for registration filed with the administrator will become effective at noon on the 30th day after the application is filed or sooner at the discretion of the administrator. So if they ask you when will it be effective, it's 30 days or sooner after the application is filed. So simply passing the test does not ever constitute registration in a state. The administrator does not approve applications, just like the SEC does not approve a new issue. To do so would open them up for legal liability. They never approve anything. They simply say everything has been received, properly processed, and you may now state that you are registered with the state if that is the case, which it will be. All investment advisor representative registrations are held at the state level. When an investment advisor is first registering, if the firm has assets under management of a hundred million or more, then that IA must register with the SEC. So federally covered investment advisors under Dodd-Frank are those advisors that manage hedge funds, mutual funds, and private funds, or those advisors that have assets under management of hundred million or more. So there used to be a much lower number for assets under management as far as registration goes, but now this is the rule for a federally covered investment advisor. Federally covered investment advisor. So hedge fund, mutual fund, private fund, and those that manage assets under management of a hundred million or more. So that those, when they're first filing for registration, that have assets under management less than a hundred million, those investment advisors register at the state level. So this is when the firm is new or when this law first came under effect, which is historical now. It's been a few years now. So that at this point, this is the rule if the firm is new, but most firms out there that are already registered, what they end up having to do, there's two things. So we said that the firm's registration renews every December 31st, or it expires at the state level. That's true. Same with IARs. On an annual basis, the firm must file an updating amendment. So if you think about the size of the assets under management for the firm, what's it going to do every single day? It's going to change, yes? So there's this 20% threshold that is written into the legislation. So 100 million, 20% of 100 million is 20 million, yes? So I'm going to make a little bracket. So we're going to have 110 on the top and we're going to have 90 million on the bottom. So 20% of 100 is 20 million. So what this is about is at the annual renewal, where does the firm have to register? So at the time that the firm files their annual updating amendment, if the firm was state registered and has assets at renewal of 110 million or more, so here's the firm, they were registered at the state level. And then when they filed their updating amendment, they discovered they had assets of 110 million or more. Now what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to switch to be federally registered. Now you're going to find that the opposite is also true. So at the time of filing an annual updating amendment, if the firm was federally registered and has assets of less than 90 million, the federally registered IA is going to have to switch and now be registered where? At the state level. 
So you definitely have to be aware of this whole idea, no more frequently than on an annual basis. A firm might have to switch registration. So they were registered with the SEC, so they were registered federally. And when they determined their size of assets under management, now there might have been depreciation in the marketplace or there might have been an outflow of investors' money. If the assets under management are less than $90 million, then that previously federally registered firm must switch to state registration. Must switch. Under Dodd-Frank, when you're determining the net worth of a client, you may not include the value of their primary residence or any associated debt. This applies both to the definition of an accredited investor and when you're determining if the person meets the definition of a qualified client, which would be someone to whom you can charge a performance-based fee. So a fee based solely upon appreciation in the account. So it's interesting, laws change actually quite frequently and how quickly the test updates the laws is always kind of out there up in the air. So there is, um, I want you to be aware of this idea of a performance-based fee. Performance-based fee. And the old rule, old rule, and the new rule, I'll give you the hints for whether or not the question has actually been updated or not. So the new rule is going to use the term qualified client. Qualified client. Where the old rule used the term high net worth individual. So I really, I wish I could tell you definitively that you'll have one or the other on the test. But I, I just, unfortunately I can't. They don't send me the test questions, they don't tell me, um, they tell me that they update the test regularly, but they really don't tell me for sure. So the old rule, the high net worth individual, is an individual with assets of 1.5 million or more, or assets under management of 750,000 or more. So we have high net worth individual under the old rule, net worth, of 1.5 million or more, or assets under management of 750,000 or more. Now, the rule has changed, but if you had a client that you were charging a performance-based fee because they met the definition of a high net worth individual, even though the limits have now changed, you can still continue under the previous contract to charge them a performance-based fee. It's to a person that you're entering into a new contract with that they must meet the new rule. So the new rule uses this term qualified client and bumps up both the net worth and the assets under management. So under the new rule, in order to charge this performance-based fee, they'll use this term qualified client so the net worth is now higher, so it's two million or more. Or the client, if they have assets under management of a million or more. So if it's a new client to whom you want to charge a performance-based fee, this rule would apply. But if you had a contract with someone under this old rule, that is still allowable in the way the Dodd-Frank legislation was written which is why I could imagine you could still see one or the other or both on your test today. It is important to remember in doing the net worth calculation or assets under management calculation, you can include the client's assets along with their spouse's assets. You can never combine assets of two unrelated people. When I said what investment advisors must register federally, I referred to what is called a private fund. So historically, there was what we call the federal de minimis rule. So this is an old rule. It was revoked under Dodd-Frank, of course. So the federal de minimis rule said if you were an investment advisor with fewer than 15 public clients who did not advertise an invest as an investment advisor, you were exempt from federal registration. So under the old rule, those advisors registered at the state level. 
But the SEC realized that there was a whole lot of money being managed under the federal de minimis rule. So the federal de minimis rule today has been revoked. Not the state rule, the state de minimis rule still stands. So what happens is these people that used to be exempt from federal registration now have to do what's called a form PF, which stands for private fund, and it is a confidential filing. These are people that manage like the Heinz family assets, the Hilton family assets. They manage a lot of really um, old money, maybe even new money, but more often times it's, you know, it's, it's just established um, family money that they're managing. So they're not just managing everyday people's money. So it's a private filing. They're private fund advisors. You can't just Google and find. Um, they're not found within the IARD as far as their form filings like you could find for everyday average investment advisors. So private fund advisors now do register federally. They do have to register federally. The state de minimis rule still stands, though, because that sometimes confuses students. So I want to make sure that you understand if the firm, the investment advisor, is registered, let's say, in Arizona, you, the firm, and the IAR can always have up to five public clients in another state without registration in that state. And you can have an unlimited number of institutional clients in another state without needing to register as an investment advisor or IAR in that state. So the state de minimis rule still stands. It was only the federal de minimis rule that was revoked. That concludes our discussion of a review of state and federal law. So we've gone over a little bit from each of the four sections on the outline for your exam. This video is designed to be a supplement to all the other hours of study that you have already done. Remember, within your course there is a cumulative set of key facts. It's a lot. It's over 70 pages. I want you to read it. It's the same concepts on the outline year in and year out. So to read these 70 some pages of key facts, you're gonna have to give yourself quite a lot of time. I bet you to read through it once is gonna take you, oh, three or four hours. It really does depend upon how fast you read. So you really wanna be reading them as a review of the course. You don't need to go back and read the whole book again, all the PDFs again, you don't have to do that. But the key facts, they're now, they're organized by section and you might see something in there within, let's say, section one, more than once, but slightly tweaked because the way they refer to things over time change. For example, the phases of the business cycle, right? Expansion, peak, contraction, trough. So what's the phase of the business cycle that occurs after recovery, but before a contraction? What's it called? Well, that's called the peak. But then another question might say, what is the phase of the business cycle that occurs after a contraction but before the recovery? Well, that's called a trough. So this idea that the same concept can be tested on in many different ways means that very often there's more than one key fact on the same topic, just slightly tweaked. That's intentional. So I want you to read those key facts, try to a minimum of three times, and that's gonna take you a while. Now, what I suggest you do is the day of your test, leave early enough so that if you get lost, get behind a bad accident, you're not late. There's nothing worse than being late to a test. You're already gonna be nervous anyway, okay? So number one, when you get there, breathe. You can do this. Read in your car Whatever it is, maybe you've made yourself like a practice cheat sheet, all those things that you have a hard time with. Maybe you review uh, a couple pages of key facts. You're not gonna wanna read the whole entire set of key facts right before you go take your test because that will just exhaust you. You do not have time to do that. But I want you to be able to sit in your car before you walk into the testing center, give yourself maybe 20 minutes to kind of thumb through some of the things you don't really don't wanna forget and then you walk in there and you just, you're ready to go. So the reading of this very, very thick cumulative, it's a lot of stuff I know, this test is so comprehensive. It's like your MBA 
licensing exam. I'm not kidding, in a little bit of law school. You can do it. My students do really, really well. You know how to reach us. If you have any questions, please just ask. It's never a bother. It is truly my honor to be your teacher. Thank you for choosing Test Teachers. And remember, success starts here.